Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. All right, welcome to today's uh, orthopedic webinar uh, titled Avoiding the Total Joint Replacement. Uh, it's wonderful to see that we have almost reached 500 participants, and I'm sure we will, uh, that number will continue to grow. We really appreciate you all spending your Saturday morning with us. My name is Dr. Darren Tay, and I'm a senior consultant and deputy uh, head of department, Singapore General Hospital Orthopedic Surgery. I'd like to first uh, begin by thanking uh, the staff of the uh, SGH Patient Liaison Service, uh, the uh, Musculoskeletal Academic Clinical Program, the uh, Postgraduate Medical Institute for uh, tire tirelessly working uh, and putting this webinar together. All right, so for today, uh, this webinar, we will have a fairly informative and exciting program for all of you, and I hope uh, you all enjoy it. As you are aware, our population is aging, and uh, as we age, uh, wear and tear and joint problems uh, become a bigger problem and an issue that affects uh, many of us. Uh, additionally, all these problems can eventually affect our function, and they affect our quality of life. Uh, additionally, uh, it is not only the uh, older patients uh, that we see, but we also see patients who have sports injuries. Uh, they have injuries which result from their lifestyle activities or even from occupations. And therefore, we also treat uh, degeneration of the joints of the leg uh, in the younger uh, patients. So certainly, this is a very relevant topic uh, for many of us. So over the next uh, hour and a half, uh, our experience panel uh, will talk to you about how we deal with such joint problems and getting patients back on track and back on their feet. Uh, we hope to share with you uh, through our current understanding of how uh, the joints work in the lower limb uh, and the associated disorders that afflict these joints, uh, that orthopedic surgeons are now able to, um, to offer patients more than just joint replacement. All right, and they are able to offer uh, bespoke, more personalized uh, procedures uh, that will hopefully be able to preserve the joints as well as to um, avoid a total joint replacement in the future. Okay, so without further ado, I will kick off today's webinar. Oh, sorry, before that, uh, there is, uh, I'm sure, going to be questions that you would like us to answer. Uh, there is a question and answer uh, function at the bottom of your Zoom app. Uh, you can click on it and type in your questions. Uh, throughout this webinar, we will uh, try to answer some of these questions. And the ones that we do not answer, we will actually leave it to the end of uh, after our talks. And then the three of the speakers today, we will uh, try to answer as many of the questions uh, as we can. Subsequently, if there are questions that are not answered or that we are unable to answer, uh, we will get back to you uh, if you're able to email us those questions as well. Uh, and we will provide that email uh, at the end of the webinar. So I hope you uh, sit back, relax. Uh, thank you again for spending your Saturday morning with us. Uh, hope this will be of benefit to you. And I will kick off first uh, talking about partial knee replacements. All right, so let me share my screen. Okay, let me start from the beginning. Okay, so uh, partial knee replacements. I'm sure all of us have heard about total joint replacements, and uh, with uh, reference to the leg, there is co most commonly the total knee replacement, and then a bit less uh, commonly done is the total hip replacement. But these two joints uh, are some of the most commonly uh, replaced joints uh, in the body, and that uh, the other joints that we sometimes deal with are like uh, shoulders and ankles and the wrist, but these are much uh, less common than the knees and the hips. So uh, we will start off with a partial knee replacement, and one could possibly argue uh, that this is still a knee replacement. But because it's only a partial knee replacement, there is partial preservation of the joint. 
Subsequently, uh, my fellow uh, speakers will talk about pure joint replacement, uh, joint preservation, where uh, we will not be putting metal parts into the knee joint uh, itself, uh, and we will be using other means uh, to try to restore function for the patients. But um, knowing what a total knee replacement, a partial knee replacement is obviously going to be a slightly smaller and more targeted uh, knee replacement. And so the question, the burning question is, doing less, are we able to get more out of it? So to begin, I'd like to just uh, talk a little bit about osteoarthritis. This is one of the most common uh, disorders of joints that we see in our clinic. Uh, it is the leading cause of physical disability. All right? So it affects a lot of patients' function and subsequently it impacts their quality of life. Additionally, in patients who are working, this physical disability leads to loss of productivity as well as taking many days of sick leave because they're in too much pain and too much dysfunction to work. And although we know that the majority of patients with osteoarthritis or more commonly known as wear and tear of the joints uh, are in the more older patients, but we also do see uh, younger patients with a similar problem. However, we know that age is certainly a big risk factor for the development of osteoarthritis. And if we look at how big this problem is, 20% of our population over the age of 65 will have some knee problems and will be seeking medical attention. And essentially, osteoarthritis is a chronic degeneration of the knee joint, right? Where does it begin? It actually starts with deterioration of the cartilage. So the cartilage is a lining of the joint and for the knee, it covers the end of the thigh bone, which is called the femur, and the upper part of the tibia or the shin bone. And it helps to allow the knee to bend and function smoothly. Now, as the uh, cartilage degenerates, it becomes thin, it starts to develop cracks. And as it wears out, subsequently, the underlying bone is exposed. And then you hear of the term bone on bone, bone rubbing on bone. And that's sometimes what we can see on x-rays. But it doesn't just stop at the cartilage. Eventually, it affects the bone. It affects the ligaments around the knee, the muscles. And patients start to have a lot of weakness and stiffness in that joint. So this is the problem that we mostly deal with. Although there are other reasons why uh, the knees and the hips could have problems. And this will be shared with you subsequently. So in general, uh, the overview of the management of osteoarthritis, usually uh, for most of our patients, when they come and see us, we would start them off with something uh, non-surgical, right? I'm sure that nobody really wants to have surgery and if it can be avoided, I think that uh, both the patient and the doctor will be very happy uh, if we can successfully restore function and quality of life without the need for surgery. And essentially, the management of arthritis of the knee starts with physiotherapy, where we try to work on patients' stiffness and weakness of their joints. We give lifestyle advices, which may include uh, avoiding certain activities, weight loss. We would recommend some supplements. Uh, that you've all heard of glucosamine. Uh, whether it really works or not, uh, it's still a question. Uh, but there are many supplements out in the market and sometimes a, having a discussion with a doctor is helpful before you spend a lot of money buying supplements which may not work. But certainly one of the other medications that we prescribe is painkillers, which we would recommend uh, to not take it um, you know, daily, but as an on-need basis. And finally, there are injections. right? So injections is a sort of bridge between totally non-surgical uh, treatment and surgical treatments. So what do we do with injections? Sometimes we inject gels to try to help to lubricate and reduce the inflammation of the knee. And more recently, we are injecting uh, a, a type of biologics called a PRP or platelet-rich plasma. And we're still studying the effects of this. So essentially, PRP is where we draw blood from your vein and we spin the, 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 the blood down and take out the healing factors and re-inject it into your knee. And then finally, it's only when all of these measures are unsuccessful do we then talk about knee surgery. And the reason why we leave it last is because there is always a risk with surgery. There is a risk with anesthesia. And if we can avoid such risks and still get the patient 
the quality of life and function that he desires or he or she desires, uh, then we would avoid it. So total knee replacement is, you know, obviously the most well-known procedure. It's very popular. And uh, in the orthopedic community, it is considered the gold standard for advanced osteoarthritis that has failed conservative treatment. Uh, most surgeons are able to provide this service, to provide this surgery. It, it is one of the more uh, commonly uh, practiced uh, procedures. And the reason being is that Whenever a patient has a surgery, right, like a joint replacement, the two things that they usually require from that procedure is that, number one, they shouldn't need another operation in a long, long time. And number two, it should give them a good clinical outcome. And so that's where, that's one of the reasons why total knee replacement is so popular. Because number one, it has a very robust track record of survivorship. We see that in our patients, over 90% of patients having a knee replacement are able to last up to 20 years or even beyond. And the results are very predictable and good with 80 to 90% of our patients having a very good outcome and being very satisfied with their procedure. And additionally, we don't rest on our, uh, we don't rest on our laurels. We continue with improvements uh, using uh, newer techniques uh, we work with uh, our engineers to improve the implants so that uh, patients uh, get a better knee, uh, a better product eventually. So if the total knee replacement is such an, a wonderful operation, uh, then why do we really need anything else? And the reason is because up to 20% of our patients, if we really ask them, are not always satisfied or happy with the results that they get from their knee replacement. A common complaint that they uh, report is that the knee doesn't feel natural. The knee is a bit stiff. It isn't, it's not as uh, flexible uh, as uh, you know, the, the knee that they had uh, when they were young. And sometimes when with climbing stairs, uh, with uh, bending the knee, uh, or even things like walking, sometimes they report that it still has aches and pains and it still hurts. So uh, we, aren't, we aren't getting that 100% satisfaction rate, which we are still working on. All right? So and that's why we have to look for potentially other solutions uh, for arthritis of the knee. And knee replacement is quite big surgery. You know? Although we wouldn't say it is as big as some of the other types of surgery, uh, it is fairly big still. It, it does have a significant impact and downtime for patients. And the rehab usually is about three months before they are walking comfortably. And uh, for some uh, activities, such as going down the steps, it may take even up to six months or beyond before they can do it uh, with confidence. So let's compare the total knee replacement to the partial. And so here you can see <clears throat> on your left, there is a total knee replacement. And on the right, uh, it's a much smaller implant, which is the partial knee replacement, or what we call a UKA, which is a unicompartmental knee arthroplasty. Unicompartmental meaning that we only change one part of the knee, whereas the total knee replacement actually changes the entire surface of the knee. But they essentially are the same, and they consist of a femoral component, which goes on the end of your thigh bone, and a tibial component that goes uh, on top of your shin bone. And both of these are made of biocompatible metals. That means that your body won't reject these metals. Now, in between these two metal parts, we would put a piece of plastic, uh, and that would prevent the two metal parts from getting in contact with each other. And you can see that the design of these implants are meant to resemble the shape of the surface of your knee, right? So how are these implants placed into your knee? And that's one of the common questions uh, that patients would ask. So, so, so obviously, we would need to open up the knee, all right? And usually, we go from the front of the knee. Uh, we would then remove the diseased bone and cartilage, and we would remove sufficient amounts so that these implants can fit inside. And how we prepare the surfaces of the bone, how we remove those diseased bones, parts would finally determine the position of these implants. So essentially, not only are we removing the diseased uh, parts of the bone, but we are also setting the foundation for the implants to go in. And here you can see the femoral components sitting on the end of the femur or the thigh bone. 
the tibial component sitting on top of the tibia. And you can also see that the patella or the kneecap is replaced with this plastic button. All right, so this is essentially a total knee replacement. And the concept is the same for uh, the partial knee replacement, except that the components are smaller and the amount of bone that we remove is less. So when we finally put uh, the implants in after the surgery, we usually get an x-ray. And these are what they would tend to look like uh, after the, the surgery. So on your right, you see the total knee replacement. You see that it covers the entire width of the knee joint. Whereas the partial knee replacement only covers a small, maybe about a third of the knee joint. And the reason why it only covers a third is because there are three main compartments in the knee. There is a medial compartment or the inner side of the knee. And that is around here. There is the lateral or uh, uh, outer side of the knee. And we could put this same implant over here as well. And then finally, there is the anterior or the front uh, compartment of the knee where we have another type of partial knee replacement that uh, can resurface that joint. So you can see that this is a much smaller implant. So when to consider a partial uh, knee replacement? So is every patient suitable for a partial knee replacement? And the answer would be no. We need to select the patients when the arthritis affecting them is less advanced. Now, we know that arthritis usually begins in one part of the knee, but if untreated, it tends to spread to other parts and eventually can involve the entire knee. So if we are able to intervene earlier where the arthritis has not spread to the entire knee, so for example, in this graphic, you can see that the damage is limited to only the inside of the knee, uh, where it is only affecting one compartment, then actually this patient may be suitable for a partial knee replacement. And of all the total knee replacement patients uh, that we have, actually when we look at the knee, 30 to 40% of them are also suitable for a partial, so that they're actually suitable for a smaller procedure. And why did they not go for a partial uh, over a total? Uh, sometimes it's because of patient's preference. Maybe some patients have had another knee, full knee replacement on the other side and they want you know, something similar that they have good experience with. And one thing that the doctor would need to exclude before they offer you a partial knee replacement is the absence of conditions that would otherwise require a total knee replacement. And that would include things like knee ligament injuries, uh, inflammation that affects the entire joint, and uh, a very common infl inflammatory disease is rheumatoid arthritis. And so in these conditions, a partial knee replacement may not be so suitable. So like I mentioned before, patient selection is vital. And so when you go and see a, a doctor or when a patient sees a doctor, an orthopedic surgeon for a consultation and is deciding between a partial and a total knee replacement, the surgeon has to decide whether the patient is at an early stage or a mid stage of arthritis where they may be eligible for a partial knee replacement or if the patient has already advanced to a late stage, whereby a total knee replacement may be the best option. And how we look, at, how we assess the patient is, number one, the pain is usually localized. So when we ask them, where is your pain that you feel? They tend to use a single finger and they can point to where that pain is. Now, if the patient actually takes both hands and grabs his entire knee, then that pain tends to be a bit more global and may not be suitable for a partial knee because it may indicate that the pain has, the arthritis has already spread throughout the knee. And finally, the knee has to be flexible. So a, a partial knee works best when the knee, when the patient's knee, it remains flexible. So one of the benefits of a partial knee replacement is that we can target the area that is causing the patient problems. So here you can see that we have uh, on the, we can put a partial knee on the inner side of the knee. We can put a partial knee on the outer side of the knee. We can put it in the front, or we can actually use a combination of these implants. And so as a result, we are able to tackle early to mid uh, arthritis of the knee, and we're able to provide a sort of tailored or bespoke type of surgery uh, that is personalized to that patient. In addition, you can see, as we mentioned, it is a much smaller implant and we don't uh, replace the entire joint surface, all right? So there is reduced joint resurfacing. And as a result, 
we are preserving a large portion of the native knee joint. So it spares the bone and cartilage of the unaffected parts of the knee. Additionally, it preserves the ligaments in the middle of the knee. And we have two big ligaments in the knee, which, may, uh, which tend to be uh, removed uh, during a total knee replacement. And that would be the uh, anterior cruciate ligament over here, and then the posterior cruciate ligament. And so these two ligaments, uh, uh, definitely the anterior cruciate and sometimes the posterior cruciate ligament, they are removed during a total. So a partial knee replacement preserves these uh, cartilage, preserves the bone, preserves the ligaments, and actually subsequently after surgery, it results in a more natural feeling knee, a knee that feels more normal. Additionally, because the implant is smaller, we don't have to make such a big uh, surgical scar, a uh, surgical incision to open up the knee. We can actually go in from the side of the knee uh, through a smaller incision to put this implant in. And as a result, we get less post-operative pain. Uh, patients are able uh, to regain their knee flexibility and bend the knee more quickly with a more complete return of uh, knee bending. And because it's a smaller incision, uh, certain complications such as infection, which is of course something that we dread as surgeons, bleeding and blood clots in the leg, also known as uh, deep vein thrombosis, are lower in a partial compared to a total. Here you can see the surgical scars that we uh, have to use to get into the knee uh, to put in uh, these uh, implants. So for a total knee replacement, we usually go through a straight vertical incision in the midline of the front of the knee, and it's a fairly generous incision because the implants are quite big. Whereas for a partial knee or a UKA, we can uh, skirt the kneecap, go from the side in a slightly oblique incision, which is usually about uh, six to 10 centimeters. So it's a much smaller incision, uh, doesn't violate the knee so much uh, and ends up with a more cosmetically pleasing uh, appearance. And really how, uh, why would a patient really want to choose something uh, that uh, is less, potentially uh, not changing the rest of the knee, which may uh, give a problem in the future. Well, some of the benefits uh, that we share with the patient is that with a more minimally invasive procedure where we try to preserve as much of the knee joint as we can, they get earlier return to normal activities such as walking, stair climbing, uh, earlier return to exercises and healthy lifestyle, sports, uh, the sports, you know, patients go back to golf, they go back to uh, doubles tennis, they go uh, back to light jogging uh, much earlier than uh, a full knee replacement. And importantly for patients who are still working, an earlier return to their work. So as we mentioned, it conserves a lot of the bone and cartilage of the knee. It preserves the ligaments. So bone conservation is very attractive for partial knee replacements. However, uh, by putting in a smaller implant, it is, uh, uh, it is technically a little bit more challenging. And with uh, a, a smaller implant, there is, uh, you know, we have to get it right. Uh, it, it, it is not tolerant of us getting it wrong uh, or putting it in the wrong position. So the outcomes of partial knee replacements are more sensitive to implant malposition. So we have to spend more time to get it uh, right. And as a result, it's technically a little bit more challenging, a little bit less forgiving than a total knee replacement. So, and additionally, there are, because we only remove a bit of bone compared to a total knee replacement, the implants are smaller. There is a smaller surface to attach the implants. And when patients have very poor bone stock, uh, when they have osteoporosis and the bone is weak, then that can also affect fixation. So a question that a lot of patients uh, ask us, and they of course need to know, is how long do partial knee replacements last? Uh, do they last as long as total knee replacements? And many case series, which are done by single surgeons or uh, small groups of surgeons, have shown that survivorship is comparable to total knee replacement. So you're not getting an inferior product. And more than 90% uh, of partial knees last up to 10 years, with 85% of uh, partial knee replacements lasting up to 20 years. However, when we look at all comers who have received partial knee replacements, we do see a slightly higher revision or reoperation rate, meaning that we have to go in for a second operation compared to a total knee replacement. So that's the benefit of a total knee replacement. All right? It is a little 
bit more robust and the survivorship is a little bit better than a partial knee replacement. And the reasons why these uh, partial knee replacements uh, may not do so well is because the plastic is very thin and it may wear out a little bit more quickly. The implants are attached to a smaller area of bone and therefore loosening of the implants can occur. And finally, because we have preserved the rest of the knee joints, sometimes uh, arthritis can creep in and start to cause problems in other parts of the joint. However, if there are problems, uh, you know, and the patients uh, are una we are unable to control the patient's symptoms uh, with therapy or medication, then we will then be able, uh, we have to convert them uh, to a total knee replacement. And so like uh, total knee replacements where we have new techniques and new implants to improve outcomes, similarly for partials, we have also technology coming in to help us to provide a better product. And uh, you know, over the last 10 years, we have been uh, seeing the introduction of robots coming into the orthopedic uh, surgical field uh, where we're able to match these implants uh, in terms of geometry and size more closely to the patient's needs. So we're able to select implants that fit patients better and we're able to put them in the patient's knee with increased precision and accuracy and reduce component malposition or wrong position of the implants. And hopefully with all these uh, benefits, we are able to give patients a better outcome as well as better survivorship. And so in conclusion, not everyone eventually needs a total knee replacement. And that's going to be the recurring theme uh, today. Uh, we have to select patients properly when it comes to partial knee replacements. So selecting the appropriate patient will allow us to offer them viable alternatives in partial knee replacements, in joint preservation. And through these uh, alternative procedures, we are also equally able to restore function and quality of life. Thank you. Okay, uh, that is the uh, first talk on joint preservation, uh, on uh, partial knee replacement. So I'd like to now invite uh, Dr. Song Jin Wei, who is our associate consultant uh, in the sports service of our department. And he will share uh, true joint preservation, a little bit different from partial uh, knee replacements. Uh, and uh, he's got, uh, he's one of our young talents with lots of uh, experience and uh, I'd like to welcome him to uh, give his presentation. Thank you so much, Prof. Good morning, everyone. So let me share my screen. Okay, so um, uh, I'm Dr. Song here. So I just want to uh, start my slides here to, uh, to uh, recommend, uh, introduce you the paradigm of knee preservation. Uh, and we, we propose this thing called the Olympic strategy for everyone. So again, some introduction on knee osteoarthritis. Basically, as men, uh, Prof has mentioned, um, knee osteoarthritis is mainly a degenerative joint disease that involves our uh, knee joint that is characterized by progressive loss of the cartilage, leading to chronic pain and functional disability. As we know, it's a, as, uh, it is a leading cause of um, functional disability globally, and there are risk factors for um, that can be associated with knee osteoarthritis, like vitamin H aging, high BMI, obesity, or lifestyle activity that can predispose to um, more wear and also degeneration in knees, like those that requires a lot of squatting or kneeling. So in a knee joint, uh, I want to let you all know, you can see on the picture on the left, there's a healthy and also a, um, a, 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 a arthritic knee. In a healthy knee, actually, the surfaces in our cartilage is actually supposed to be smooth and it should be effortless when you bend your knee, when you walk. So patients can actually uh, and, and in a healthy knee it has to be also be stable so that there's actually normal motion in the knee that can actually and also with a uh, with an intact um, ligaments and also in the knee we have this thing called meniscus which i would elaborate further that can actually reduce more stress on the knee 
So in the arthritic knee, that's where the structures in the knee get degenerated, the meniscus get worn out, the ligaments get loose, the cartilage get uneven. And when the cartilage get uneven, that's where the joint movement wouldn't be as effortless as before. And hence, patients can get soreness around the muscle at the end of the day when you walk. And also with arthritic knee, with the uneven joint surfaces, this can cause more irritation around the knee joint. And hence, that, 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 pre, that happens where patients get inflammation in the knee and then they present with pain and swelling and also difficulty squatting and kneeling. So the signs in patients with osteoarthritic knee is where they can get deformity, like bow-leggedness. Bow-legged is the picture on the uh, top right-hand corner. Or knock knee. Uh, in medical terms, it's called genobalgum, like an X-shaped knee. They get tenderness around the knee joint and reduce range of motion. And on the x-ray, when uh, patients present with arthritis, that's where you can appreciate that there is actually reduced in the joint line, joint space here. So this x-ray shows the knee joint. The top part is your thigh, this the uh, lower part of your thigh bone. And the bottom bone here is the tibia, which is the, uh, your, the upper part of your shin bone. So you can see that the cartilage is actually worn out over at, uh, in this particular knee joint with bone spur and also um, in this short film, you can see that actually there is some bow leggedness um, that is going to happen for this patient. So this slide shows that um, there is a whole um, array of treatment that we can have um, in treatment of osteoarthritis. And this is like a reconstructive ladder we can see from a repair stage here where we try to address the instability or ligament problem or with cartilage um, uh, surgery to try to deal with the, the uneven cartilage or cartilage ulcer or there's some um, pa some patients we can try with a knee unloader and then we also have this option of what which I will elaborate more on is on osteotomy basically basically creating um, a bone cut that actually will create a realignment of your uh, knee for a more optimal um, alignment and then subsequently is on knee replacement. As Prof has um, explained um, for the last 20 minutes about the half knee replacement, which is a smaller surgery as compared to the total knee replacement. And then lastly, to the salvage procedures where we need, a patient may need to go, this is rarely done, but may need to go for arthro disease, means fusion of the knee. And even the worst case scenario, very rarely done is amputation. So, as uh, Prof has um, 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 explained just now, in a knee joint, um, it, um, the total knee replacement was actually a very commonly done procedure and it's also like a gold standard procedure. But there is also uh, issues that, that we have to uh, consider because in a knee replacement, when we actually put in, uh, implant the knee into the person, it will be permanently in the knee. And these implants cannot be taken out the patients have to be walking on it. So these implants will be subjected, can be subjected to uh, uh, wear and also um, loosening. So, and uh, rightfully, I mean, uh, in literatures and, and um, if, it, if we know that patients who are younger, who are younger than 55 years old, they can have a higher chance of a need for revision surgery as compared to patients who go through this surgery at an older age. Firstly, mainly two reasons. Firstly, they, 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 they are expected to live much longer. And in Singapore context, uh, life expectancy of Singaporeans are getting longer up to 85 or 90, uh, 85 mainly. And also with these younger patients, they are usually much more uh, active, have higher expectation of uh, their functional status, and they may even be working. So in our department, we also, uh, we, we propose this, we have this uh, paradigm of knee preservation where we, look into this Olympic strategy. So you can see the different, the five, the five rings here. Um, each, each of these ring essentially address the uh, components of the knee. So the blue ring here, basically it means osteotomy, settling, which, which we work on the alignment of the patient. And then yellow ring here, basically looking uh, at cartilage repair. And then black ring here is on meniscus surgery. And then the green ring here is on the ligament surgery to ensure make the knee stable. And lastly, this red ring is mainly on autobiologics, which I will elaborate later. 
So this knee, um, knee osteotomy is mainly the workhorse in knee preservation surgery. It so involves the cutting and realignment of either the shin bone or the thigh bone so as to achieve an optimal weight-bearing axis for the knee. So the type of surgery that we actually can uh, perform for our patients is high tibia osteotomy, which you can see on this picture here, where we cut on the shin bone and we fix it with plates and screws and then create a realignment for this patient. And then second one is distal femoral osteotomy, which is over here, where we cut on the thigh bone and then we recreate a new alignment for the patient. And lastly, double osteotomy means cutting both the shin and thigh bone. So in osteotomy, this procedure actually, um, um, it may be quite new to everyone, but this procedure actually has been uh, old procedure even in the 1980s. Um, and it has been performed um, since decades. Essentially, in the past, uh, the osteotomy technique, um, there were also there were lack of the use of intraoperative x-rays to ensure proper alignment for the patients. Um, and subsequently, with the introduction of knee replacement, and with accurate instrumentation, then to uh, achieve a uh, to, to produce a re to get a reproducible results, the knee replacement surgeries um, superseded this procedure and uh, became more popular. But uh, um, this procedure, this knee osteotomy, subsequently, now at this modern age, there is actually advancement in our uh, advanced imaging and so with computer planning and improvement in technique and also implant we actually do see an uprising of this old procedure uh, in many parts of the world, like in Europe, Korea, Japan. And so we are um, doing this also for our patients now in for knee osteotomy. So in our, I, I'll just introduce to everyone, this is like the typical workflow that we um, do for our patients when we um, uh, see a patient with uh, this, in, in this case, with a slight bow leggedness and also the inner knee pain. So in this um, patient, we actually send them for an x-ray and using the x-ray films, we can actually do computer planning and we can actually um, accurately measure the, the, the mechanical axis or rate, uh, the alignment for the patient. And we can actually plan out the level of the shin bone cut and the amount of bone opening gap that we want to achieve for the patient to actually achieve a accurate realignment and a correction of the alignment for the patient. So these are some x-rays that um, in, in, in the surgery that we do that we actually perform the bone cut for the patient with another small technique that we uh, 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 create that we put a wire along the um, outer part of the knee here so as to protect the bone to prevent fractures and subsequently, after we have opened up um, the gap, this gap also with the modern technique now, we filled up this bone gap with bone graft so as to allow um, more structural support to prevent complications for patient as um, over here. So we shape our femoral, uh, we shape our bone graft into the, to the measured alignment uh, bone size that we want and then we fit it in over here and then we actually fix it with the plates and screws. So these are some examples of um, the knee osteotomy that we have performed. Like uh, this patient who have uh, both legs were bow-legged and then we have done by uh, both HTO procedures for the patient and um, achievement of the correction of the alignment. And this is someone with, uh, with a very bad uh, knock knee. You can see that the um, this yellow line we measure from the center of the hip down to the center of the ankle, and we can appreci appreciate that every time the person walk with the body weight, it actually cross it actually crosses outside the knee. So the patient would have was presenting with much pain on the outer part of the knee joint. And on this picture on the right, you can see that with a double level osteotomy, we have recorrect uh, we have corrected the alignment for the patient, and then they have uh, now the mechanical the weight-bearing axis actually crosses the center of the knee and that relieves the stress on the outer part of the knee. 
So there is um, um, a little bit of a uh, um, cross indications in terms of an early knee osteoarthritis where um, it involves just the inner part of the knee where we can either go both ways of, um, of a half knee replacement as Prof has actually described and or a HTO, which is the uh, realignment procedure. The, there are pros, uh, there are benefits and uh, and uh, pros and cons uh, for these two procedures. Um, we 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 do know that with uh, advanced knee osteoarthritis, um, where it's already bone on bone, we do uh, is actually more predictable to have our uh, uh to do a half knee replacement surgery for for this uh, group of patients, but with the modern technique and also um, better uh implant, we have actually was able to actually achieve a, a quite a comparable outcome as uh, as a half knee replacement with the use of HTO. So one of the benefits in um, doing HTO is that, as you all can appreciate on this x-ray, the implants that we use that we fix on the bone is actually not in, uh, involving the knee joint. All these implants and the correction that we have performed are involving either the shin bone as outside the knee or the thigh bone, as um other uh, as the previous slides have uh, shown you all, so there is no contact of this implant with the knee with the with the knee joint with the movement of the knee, so these implants they would not be subjected to stress or wear, when after the um after the bone osteotomy site has actually healed, so the patient actually can have this new alignment of the knee, and eventually if they may not have liked the idea of having an implant in their cell, they can actually consider removing this implant one year later and they will have a new knee alignment um, that is actually in a more optimal uh, with a more optimal um, alignment for their for their knee joint. And in uh, HDO in uh, papers we've seen the survival rate of this HDO in terms of 10 years there is a um, quite it's a good um, results they can have a 80, up to an 80% survival rate um, um, of HTO in 10 years um, in trying to try to delay this um, degenerative joint process for patients. So with the advancement of this um, um, osteotomy, there are also there are a lot of interest in 3D printing and uh, we have also um, this uh, concept of a PSI, which is patient-specific instrumentation for uh, knee osteotomy. So for this um, jig, you can see here, these are actually 3D printed jig that can be fixed on patients, either the thigh bone or the shin bone that actually allow us to guide the amount, uh, the cut that we can have for the patient. So the patient usually, we will bring them for uh, a pre-operative CT scanning first. And then with the details of their knee and the morphology, the, the shape of their knee reconstructed, we can actually have a patient-specific jig that can be created for them. Um, then you can actually bring this in for surgery. So pardon me, the next picture will be a bit bloody, but I just show you all uh, one of the some of the intraoperative pictures. So over here, you can see this white jig that um, the previous slide I showed you all. It's, a, it's actually fixed on the patient's shin bone, and then the saw blade is actually on the slot, and that allows us to um, saw um, do perform the osteotomy at the um, pre-planned um, site. So this can minimize the amount of x-rays that is required during the surgery and also reduce the operative time. So for this patient, it underwent the, the surgery and then the alignment was um, was achieved, the realignment was achieved. In our uh, in SGH also we have this 3D center uh, printing center, which um which also can um uh, we, we work closely together as well to um, create a patient's a PSI jig for patients. So this is one of the uh, early planning that we have uh, worked on with our radiologist and radiographer, where uh, using the CAT design uh, for this patient who, uh, who have undergone the CT scans, we actually create the, um, the, the we plan the level of bone cut that we want for the patient. And then subsequently, this uh this patient's knee was actually 3D printed and then we can actually um execute and perform the osteotomy on the knee model first before we actually bring it to the OT and perform for the patient proper. And um this is what just 
pardon me, but it's a bit bloody. So this one of the videos that shows that um, how we actually slot the bone cut onto the shin, the patient's bone, and then we perform the surgery. So the next domain um, is on cartilage repair. So cartilage essentially is a uh, uh, is this in in layman term we call it the soft bone that lines the 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 thigh bone the end of the thigh bone and also upper part of the shin bone. So they are supposed to be smooth. They are supposed, they, um, this, this delicate cartilage, um, as what we know, is called high line cartilage. And this cartilage actually, they have, unfortunately, they have poor uh, healing potential. And hence, with when they are damaged, they do not heal. They can progress to further ulcers and further degeneration in the knee and, and pain, and essentially pain for the patient. So there are um, different strategies we can um, um, do to actually try to repair these cartilage ulcers. Also, depending on the degree, whether the, the, the cartilage wear uh, was localized or a diffuse kind, or whether it is superficial or deep, we can consider for keyhole surgery or arthroscopic procedures where, with uh, what we call chondroplasty, which is cleaning up or shaving, shaving the, the, cleaning up the cartilage surfaces or microfracture, which later on I will show you all some pictures, or this procedure called osteochondral autologous transfer surgery, OATS, or knee joint distraction. So microfracture, this picture can see that that's um, in, in a keyhole surgery, we actually perform small perforation on this localized um, um, cartilage ulcer. And when we perform this small perforation, that allows bleeding to occur. And then, um, there will be this uh, mesenchymal clot that will actually form around this region and that's hopefully stimulate healing for the uh, cartilage area. Next procedure is called OATS, uh, as I described. Basically, it means a transfer for um, a, a cartilage bone plug from the area of the knee that is not required for weight bearing to the crucial area of the knee that is actually required for weight bearing. Next, uh, knee joint distraction. This is uh, a up and coming new procedure that is um, um, that we are working on. Um, knee joint distraction essentially is a uh, um, is a procedure where the patient will be and uh, will have to be subjected to a um, a form of external fixation device that can distract the knee joint, and with as we will know, knee degeneration is actually a very complex uh, process of that involve um, not just the cartilage on the knee, uh, degeneration of the cartilage. It also involves the changes in the uh, bone that's around the cartilage and also the ligaments around the cartilage. So there are many animal studies or uh, uh, lab studies have shown that in knee joint distraction, when the joint is actually subjected to uh, um, distraction, it actually creates uh, um, uh, changes in the uh, sino, uh, in changes in the fluid state of uh, fluid in terms of the enzymes and also the um, the cytokines in the joint that can actually simulate a cartilage repair. It also causes causes changes in the bone that's around the 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 cartilage that can also help stimulate healing in the cartilage. So. For this patient, he had um uh this patient had a very bad arthritis and uh, was relatively very young, so we have proposed this procedure for uh, for the patient as a salvage um to 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 avoid the need for uh, knee replacement, and can see interesting interestingly nicely the patient actually un after the knee joint distraction and after the removal of implant there were improvement in the cartilage thickness for this patient, and on this X ray we can even appreciate that the bow leggedness was actually improved for this patient. Okay, so the next domain we look at is uh, ligament reconstruction. Because ligament, as I um, explained, in a healthy knee joint, ligaments are really important for the stability. And that actually helps to prevent excessive motion that will result in acceler accelerated wear in the knee. So the main ligaments in the knee, uh, you have the anterior cruciate ligament or the posterior cruciate ligament or the collateral ligaments. And these ligaments are really important to prevent the, the, the risk of uh, getting further excessive motion and then uh, they can actually predispose one to having a degenerative knee. So the procedures that we actually do 
involved in someone who have a uh, 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 injured this ligament, we can actually perform uh, um, anterior cruciate reconstruction or posterior cruciate reconstruction or other ligaments reconstruction surgery. Okay. The next domain is on meniscus repair surgery. So meniscus is a structure that is actually inside our knee joint um, over here. You can see that in our thigh bone, in our, in our shin bone, there is this um, um, structure in the knee that acts like a cushion that wedge between the thigh and the shin bone. So this meniscus, um, you have an inner meniscus and also an outer meniscus. They are like C-shaped structure. And I always call it like a float that is actually um, wedged between these two bones. And they are important to actually protect the cartilage um, because with the loss of, because if you imagine if there's a loss of this uh, cushion, the bone will be rubbing hard on hard on each other and then they can subject to high stress and wear. So in a degenerative knee, this meniscus can commonly be also be worn out and uh, be torn. So the procedures that we do for our patients, also we try to repair them. So we can either do a meniscus repair or with a root repair or a meniscus centralization. So if you all can see on this picture on the right, um, so that meniscus I mentioned, they have to wedge between the thigh bone and the shin bone. And when meniscus then get degenerated, these meniscus sometimes they get extruded where they actually comes out of the joint margin. And when that happened, because we can see that the meniscus, our meniscus is actually in a cross section, it's a triangular shape, like a wedge. And when the meniscus get extruded more, there will be lesser of the body of the meniscus that helps to prevent the contact or reduce the contact of the um, between the thigh and the shin bone. So the idea of doing this procedure of knee of meniscus centralization is where we actually bring the meniscus in towards the uh, margin of the knee joint. And that will reconstitute the function of the meniscus and hopefully reduce the, 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 the stress in the knee. And in some cases where there's um, very severe uh, degenerative meniscus, where there's a defect in the meniscus and it would be difficult to salvage that, we also have procedures like meniscus allograft transplantation, where we get um, allograft from donor and then we actually harvest, and after we harvest, uh, these are from allograft from other um, from, from, from other donors, where we actually pull it in to a patient's knee. And you can see on the picture on the left, these are the defect on the meniscus. And then on the right here is after the transplant, where we um, there's the defect is actually filled up. Okay, the last domain is on autobiologics. Um, these are, uh, this is a rapid, rapidly growing field in terms of um, regenerative medicines, where uh, it can actually offers to help us treat uh, acute or chronic orthopedic surgeries. So one of the common uh, um, um, autobiologics that we use is uh, platelet-rich plasma, PRP injection, where we draw blood from the patient and then we spin down these bloods and we get the plasma-rich platelets, a platelet-rich plasma. And then this platelet-rich plasma actually has high concentrations of um, good cytokines and also growth factors that can actually help to stimulate healing in the knee. And then subsequently, it can be injected in the knee. And there's also another one. It's called uh, bone marrow aspirate concentrate. It's called BMAC, where we harvest the bone marrow from the adjacent bone, and then we spin it down and also inject the knee. And, um, and also with this, we actually can help to uh, create more healing in the knee joint. So this is my last slide. Uh, so um, it's our Olympic uh, strategy uh, where we can actually have a, in SGH orthopedic, we can actually have a personalized um, care for, for patients in terms of looking into individual structures on the knee and try to actually preserve the knee joint by um, getting a good repair and a good, good alignment for the knee. Yeah, so that is the end of my presentation. So the next, okay.
So thank you everyone. Um, my next speaker will be Dr. Benjamin Ang, um, our consultant in sports surgery. So he will be talking on knee preservation surgery and uh, and hip preservation surgery, and then um, yeah, Dr. Ben. Thank Thanks, you. Junoe. Thank you. All right. A very good morning to all. Thank you for tuning into our webinar on a precious Saturday morning. I'm Dr. Benjamin Ang, I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Singapore General Hospital. And for the next 15 minutes or so, uh, you will be hearing from me about hip preservation surgery. You have heard from my colleagues earlier regarding uh, avoiding the total knee replacement and the options you have. So now we will change channel and move to the hip. Uh, and I will be speaking on avoiding the hip replacement. Much of the causes of arthritis is similar as to the knee, so I will be focusing more on the differences rather than repeating what has already been shared. So this is a total hip replacement. The reason why we are here today is to find out how we can avoid this, if at all possible. First of all, the target, the target age uh, group for this talk and for hip preservation surgery are patients under 60 years old. So if you are over 60 years old and you have end-stage osteoarthritis and are looking for ways to avoid the total hip replacement, this may be the wrong webinar for you. Um, the total hip replacement is a very good surgery with excellent results and it is the gold standard of treatment if you have end-stage osteoarthritis. So if you, if you have end-stage osteoarthritis, you can log off now, make an appointment with us and we can plan your total hip replacement. Thank you. Jokes aside, even if you are over 60, you may actually want to stay tuned in, especially if you started having hip pain from a younger age, as you may want to ask your children, your younger relatives to actually see us at an earlier age or stage to check out uh, their hips before they develop uh, end-stage osteoarthritis. As a matter of fact, I have patients uh, with osteoarthritis whom I'm treating and also uh, treating their children or relatives and managing their hip problems from a younger age. The most common reason for hip replacement is osteoarthritis, which is what we will be focusing on today. Time does not allow us to go into all the possible reasons for someone requiring a hip replacement, but they include fractures, avascular necrosis, and other inflammatory arthritis such, such as rheumatoid arthritis, and even other rare conditions such as tumor. The x-rays here shows a normal hip joint on the left with preserved joint space, and an osteoarthritic hip on the right with obliterated joint space and osteophytes. So by the time you reach uh, the x-rays on the right, you are too late for joint preservation. So if you want to avoid the hip replacement, then you need to first avoid osteoarthritis. The causes of osteoarthritis is multifactorial, as previously mentioned, and among these, they include age, injuries, lifestyle factors, and genetics, many of which are outside our control. So what can we do? Of course, you can eat a healthy lifestyle, get proper exercise, avoid putting on too much weight, and which will, actually, which will end up loading our joints more. But what else? One way is early detection and correction. And this is what I like to speak more about. I like to give you an analogy. If you drive a car uh, with tires that are not aligned, you would expect an even and accelerated wear of your tires and needing to change your tires at a much earlier time than expected. In the same way, if we imagine our hips to be like the tires of a car, then we can understand that the alignment of our hip is crucial in how long your hips will last before the so-called wear and tear or osteoarthritis set in, and then you require a total hip replacement. There are recognized conditions such as femoral acetabular impingement and hip dysplasia, which are precursors of arthritis. Having these conditions uh, are like having your tires that are not aligned. And therefore, addressing these conditions at an earlier age before they develop into osteoarthritis is one way to avoid or at least delay the onset of arthritis and thus a hip replacement. Just a bit of background, I did my hip preservation surgery fellowship at INSA Hospital in Bern, Switzerland. It is the so-called birthplace of femoral acetabular impingement, and it is also where uh, Professor Gans described and performed the Bernese uh, periacetabular osteotomy, which is the treatment for hip dysplasia. There are only a very small handful of fellowship-trained hip preservation surgeons in Singapore, of which I am probably the only one currently in public practice. 
And therefore, it's no coincidence that I'm speaking to you about hip preservation surgery. So I will go into more detail about these two conditions over the, after this. So what is femoral acetabular impingement? Femoral acetabular refers to the femur, which is your thigh bone, and the acetabulum, which is the socket of your hip. And around the acetabulum, there is a cartilaginous labrum, as you can see in the diagram. Impinge, as defined by the Merriam-Webster dictionary, is encroach or infringe, to have an effect, make an impression, to strike or dash, especially with a sharp collision. So putting it together, abnormal encroachment and collision between the femur and the acetabulum results in femoral acetabular impingement. Femoral acetabular impingement, or FAI, can be divided into two main forms, the pincer deformity and the cam deformity, although there is combined form and other rarer causes of impingement. In the more common cam deformity, there is abnormal bone at the femoral hip neck junction, as you can see the GIF. Uh, in certain positions, such as in a deep squat, extra bone impinges on the labrum, right over there. And this results in damage to the labrum. It can result in labral tears in cartilage wear, and this can result in pain. In the pincer deformity, the problem is with the acetabulum instead of the femur. The excess bone on the acetabulum on the right, you can see, impinges against the femoral neck, and this also results in damage to the labrum and cartilage. This damage to the labrum and cartilage results in pain and also accelerates the progression to osteoarthritis. Patients with femoral acetabular impingement usually present with pain in the groin, but may also present with pain in the side or pain in the buttocks. So we need to differentiate this from other causes of pain, such as back pain. The pain may be worse in certain positions, such as deep squats. And x-rays are commonly performed as the first line investigations. Uh, however, unless the deformity is severe, they may easily be missed on routine x-rays of the hip or the pelvis. In these x-rays, you can see the excess uh, bone uh, on the image on the right, and the femoral neck. There's, uh, let me try to highlight it for you. Over there, you can see that that part is not normal, just like what the, the, the picture earlier showed. There's also this thing over here, which is a synovial herniation pit, which is a sign of impingement. Most of the time, specialized x-ray views are required, such as these. These are the done views where the hip is positioned in a certain angle to take this shot. Uh, these uh, make it more obvious. Uh, these are the x-rays of the same patient with the excess bone seen more clearly. However, x-rays are only able to see bone, so we can see the deformity uh, of the bone, but we are unable to assess the labrum. Thus, MRI is usually required for diagnosing labral tears. Special sequences MRI may also be required to pick up subtle deformities of the femoral neck, which may be missed on x-rays. <coughs> So femoral acetabular impingement may be treated arthroscopically with keyhole incisions. Through this minimally invasive approach, the torn labrum can be repaired or reconstructed, and the excess bone can be removed with a special instrument called a burr to resolve the impingement. So this can be done for the cam deformity, for the pincer deformity, or for both in the combined deformity. In some revision cases, or even some certain complex cases where the deformity is severe, very rarely, open surgery may be required to address them. Next, we will move on to hip dysplasia. Hip dysplasia is when there is inadequate coverage of the femoral head due to a shallow acetabulum. As you can see, the picture on the left shows a normal acetabulum, while the picture on the right shows a shallow acetabulum. From what we know in physics, pressure equals to force divided by area. So due to the undercoverage of the femoral head, the area bearing the load is smaller, resulting in a greater pressure given the same force or same weight. So this leads to increased labral tears, cartilage damage, and accelerated osteoarthritis. Once again, patients usually present with hip pain and when there's some damage already. This is a 3D diagram showing hip dysplasia on the left side of the photo and a normal hip on the right. 
And this uh, simulated X-ray diagram makes it clear that the coverage is much lesser on the left compared to the right. Diagnosis is done on X-rays. Uh, to an untrained eye, this may look like a normal pelvis X-rays. However, if we measure the lateral center edge angle, it measures about 12 degrees. As you can see, marked up, which is dysplastic. Normal center, normal center edge angle is more than 25 degrees, while borderline is between 20 and 25. So 12 is clearly dysplastic. This, the next X-ray is an X-ray of another patient, a patient B with a lateral center edge angle of 15 degrees, which is also abnormal. So what can we do to treat hip dysplasia? Periacetabular osteotomy is what is performed. Peri means around, acetabulum is the socket of the hip. So osteotomy refers to cutting of the bone. So put together, periacetabular osteotomy is a complex series of several osteotomies performed for patients with hip dysplasia to improve the coverage of the hip joint and delay progression of osteoarthritis. As the schematic diagram shows, after the bone is cut, uh, the fragment is rotated to increase the coverage and to redistribute the weight bearing forces onto a larger surface area, thereby reducing the pressure on the cartilage each time you stand or walk. As it is a complex procedure and the pelvis is a three dimensional structure, CT scans are, are commonly done to better quantify the deformity and also to plan the surgery, plan the cuts. Furthermore, the information from the CT scan can be extracted to create 3D models which can help uh, aid surgery. This is a, 3D, um, a printed 3D model which for, to help plan one of my patient's surgery. For those of you who tuned in two weeks ago, you may have also heard from my colleagues how the advances in 3D printing technology has aided different surgeries. On top of just printing the 3D models, uh, you can see a customized jig on the right side. <coughs> With the aid of the computer and our 3D printing center engineers, we have designed patient-specific 3D printing guides to aid the surgery. These 3D printed cutting jigs allow for more accurate planning and execution of the planned osteotomies during the surgery. These jigs uh, also uh, allow and uh, enable this complex surgery to be performed more quickly, more accurately, and also more, more importantly, more safely for the patient. There is no published literature on this yet, so we may be among the first few in the world to do this. Here's the post-operative x-ray for the first patient, patient A, which shows the lateral center edge angle that has been corrected to about 30 degrees, which is normal. The fragment is held with a few screws, as you can see, while allowing the bone to heal. This is the post-op x-ray for patient B once again showing correction of the lateral center edge angle to about 30 degrees. After surgery, the patients require crutches for two to three months to offload the bone while waiting for the bone to heal in the improved position. As earlier mentioned, the usual age group for patients undergoing hip preservation surgery are the young patients in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, mostly below 50s, 50 years of age uh, before the onset of osteoarthritis. It's especially so for the periacetabular osteotomy as, it's an, as it is an open procedure uh, which carries a higher risk and has a longer recovery time. Thus, it is more suited for younger and fitter patients. For hip atroscopy, as it is a minimally invasive surgery with a shorter downtime, sometimes we may stretch the indication slightly uh, for a slightly older patient with milder arthritis who is not yet ready for a total hip replacement. So in conclusion, if you have persistent hip pain, it may be worth seeing a doctor get it, to get it checked out uh, with some imaging, even if you are young and unlikely to have end-stage arthritis. Intervention at an earlier age before the onset of arthritis may help to avoid or at least delay your hip replacement. As they say, a stitch in time saves nine, and in this case, it may save your hips too. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to addressing your queries. Okay, thank you, Ben, for the talk on uh, 
hip preservation and Chinue on the top on knee preservation. Uh, so right now we will get all the speakers uh, onto the screen uh, and we will take the next uh, maybe 25 to 30 minutes uh, trying to uh, go through some of the um, some of the questions that have been raised through the Q and A function, uh, I will I will probably just read them out one by one, and then maybe I'll invite uh, either Dr. Ben or Dr. Chinwei to answer them. Okay, so uh, maybe we will start. So uh, from uh, Miss Ivy Tan, she she asks each time I go up a stairs, I hear only one knee cracking sound, but no pain. Uh, at all, and I am osteoporotic too. What should I do uh, from here? Hi, right, Prof. I'll take this uh, okay. question. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Ms. Tan, so uh, essentially, if you have no pain at all, actually, it's quite common that uh, patients, it's quite common uh, symptoms from patients always asking whether they get cracking sound in their knee. Um, sometimes it could be just a bit of... Um, a bit of like the joint have a bit of um high pressure in the in the knee joint and then you get this kind of clicking like for example cracking of fingers that sort but if it doesn't cause pain usually it's uh it's quite benign so um unless um there is cracking or crepitus in the knee that uh results in pain and limited range of motion then we may be a little bit more concerned of uh, a bit of early degeneration in the knee. Um, uh, due to the uneven um, surfaces of the cartilage as I, um, we, we uh, described just now. So osteoporosis actually may not, uh, it's a different uh, thing because osteoporosis mainly is on the bone quality uh, as opposed to osteoarthritis is the cartilage problem. So osteoporosis for itself, if you are diagnosed with that, mainly it also depends on the, um, how, how severe osteoporosis might be. Then the, uh, with your managing uh, doctor, we can either... Uh, treat you with, um, give you a bit of supplement or there may be uh, proper um, th uh, therapy like uh, uh, bisphosphonate treatment for, for osteoporosis. Um, but for yourself, what you can do essentially is to be, uh, to maintain your active lifestyle, uh, to go for weight bearing, do uh, simple weight bearing exercises, go for morning walk and um, morning walk, you get a very good vitamin, a good dose of vitamin D from the morning sun and that helps with your bone, bone health as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so um, another question. What do you recommend uh, for osteoarthritis of the thoracic vertebrae in a female who is 38 years of age? Uh, okay. I'll probably take this. Okay, so, so okay. osteoarthritis, I think in the, in the upper back vertebrae, it seems like um, maybe the, the only joint that is involved in the upper back is the facet joint. And... Um, that may be source of pain for your upper back. I, I would be interested in knowing of how you actually get this diagnosis. Was it from an MRI scan or an X-ray that a physician had mentioned to you? Um, again, osteoarthritis, unfortunately, as all the um, all the talks that we are talking here, there isn't a real cure in um, um, in treating degeneration or aging or, or degenerative joint. Essentially, it's management of the symptoms and treating it uh, with uh, um, um, whether there's uh, what sim on the symptoms that um, our, our patients present. So pain mainly, you can, uh, if pain essentially, it may mean that your joint may be a bit on a high um, stress. Also, depending on the alignment of your, of your spine, was it uh, in an optimal straight spine or could there be a bit of a overbending or scoliosis uh, that you might have? Then, um, essentially, the conservative measures is is still with a core strengthening exercise for your for yourself. And if severe pain, you may want to consider a bit of light painkiller that can help you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's another question on uh, lumbar scoliosis. Um, but he's. I think you you mentioned that you're seeing your uh, some orthopedic surgeon for a review. So perhaps maybe you can take it up with him uh, so that he can. Uh, examine you and uh, and maybe give you advice from there. All right, another question from uh, Miss Maureen Lim is, hello doctor, how to maintain and preserve joint replacements? Uh, are there any uh, food, supplements, that and exercise uh, to do or to avoid? I think uh, as 
<coughs> the joints have been replaced. Uh, food and supplements are uh, not ex uh, not uh, crucial in uh, in uh, replenishing any cartilage that may be lost because the, the joint is really, it's really a metal joint now. So I, I think, of course, it's still important to eat healthily uh, so that you do not put on too much weight. Uh, in terms of muscle strength, of course, adequate protein and, of course, uh, physiotherapy and strengthening exercises will help keep the muscles strong and help uh, preserve the joint for a longer period of time. Uh, avoiding excessive uh, weight gain is something that's important so that you do not load the knee replacement uh, or hip replacement, for that matter, uh, excessively. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, what is the cause of arthritis and osteoarthritis? And maybe I'll just take that. There are uh, two main uh, causes, one which we call primary uh, arthritis and one is secondary. So primary arthritis is when uh, there really isn't a specific cause. It's usually related to your weight, your alignment, uh, genetics, uh, and uh, that the secondary types would be maybe there is one significant cause. Maybe you had an injury, uh, a fracture, a ligament tear, uh, you've got uh, some uh, other diseases uh, that cause inflammation in the joints. And so, uh, the, or maybe you were born with a structural abnormality. All right? And so the knee usually uh, that we see usually has primary arthritis, although sometimes we see traumatic arthritis uh, where patients have had previous trauma. But usually in the hip, uh, you know, as we, we heard uh, from Dr. Ben, uh, a lot of these patients have some structural uh, deformity maybe come from childhood. They have some abnormality in the shape, or the of the of the joint, or the shallowness of the socket, and and this leads to a secondary arthritis of the hip. All right. So, uh, what nutrition food to consume in order to prevent degeneration? As mentioned, not really very much that, uh, in terms of food. Uh, I'm a young person. So another one is uh, I'm a young person, age thirty six of uh, years experiencing difficulties to extend my knees and uh, walk after being in a stationary position, example, sitting or standing for 10 minutes. Uh, is this an early stage of osteoarthritis and what can you do to prevent or slow it down? Yeah, um, so this sounds like, um, I, I, it, it really depends on whether you have any um, injury uh, in the past or was there any twisting injury that might have occurred and um, the difficulty in the range of motion sounds like there may be a mechanical block in the knee. Um, at the very least, in this age, we should at least get an uh, x-ray film to ensure there's, there's, um, there's no other bony issues. And then uh, you may even want to consider, we may even want to consider an MRI scan in the knee to look for um, the intra-articular structures like meniscus, if there might, might be any tear that may explain why you have the problem with extending uh, your knee. Um, early arthritis, yes, sometimes do present with what we call startup pain and startup stiffness. The way you describe may be related, but uh, like I said we need uh, some form of imaging to ensure um, no other uh, conditions, and then we we can actually work on the uh, the your your problem. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, how about wraps? How about knee wraps? Uh, does it help with uh, when running? So, um, in knee wrap, um like a knee brace. I think there are also many other similar questions on this. Um, the, the, the knee wrap actually doesn't really prevent osteoarthritis. Uh, essentially, it does help. Um, it does help if there's any element of instability in knee. Mm -hmm. But um, one thing that sometimes we do not really encourage patients to um, use is that not to be too reliant on the use of knee wrap to actually um, do... Um, um, your daily activities. Um, it, it can be um, used in uh, instances where you may want to um, do something a bit more strenuous at a particular um, uh, event like a marathon run or, or a long distance running with your, with your friend. But um, using too much of this uh, knee wrap const constantly may result in uh, reliance on it and even to the point of uh, using it for your uh, basic needs of your daily uh, act, act, uh, act, activities or living. And in that, those kind of cases, then that may not be too uh, recommended. So so, so essentially, the, the short answer to this is that you can wear it, but essentially uh, not to use it too, too often. Uh, yeah, and uh, you should get a clinician to actually check on you and why you may need this um, and see whether it's a problem with your ligament or your cartilage issue. 
Okay, so uh, yes or no, uh, when doing stretching exercises, is it okay to include a few squatting exercises as well? All right, so that's that's a yes. Uh, another, another yes or no, uh, may I know, does exercise delay degeneration of osteoarthritis or osteoporosis? Could it help? Uh, I think that we do recommend uh, exercise. Uh, if too late, would you suggest injections? So maybe what? Uh, if I'm interpreting it correctly, in very advanced osteoarthritis, would injections help? That's probably a good question. I think earlier this uh, same uh, uh, query was saying her husband is uh, 85. Mm. Right. So it's, 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 right. Just, if it's, so it's too late as in, as in for age, probably there is no age limit, right? There's no cutoff. But what happens if, like, say, for too late in terms of that the arthritis is, you know, is bone on bone, the arthritis is very severe already. I think if the arthritis is very severe, then uh, injections may have a limited uh, benefit. Okay, good. Uh, any way to correct uh, knock knees or bow, both knees uh, non-surgically? Um, so for knock knee and bow knee, actually, these are chronic alignments. Um, Many times when um this when patients actually present to us this they are usually at adulthood, um so non surgical treatment uh to to correct it unfortunately is not uh, uh not possible because it's really structural and bony, uh insoles and stability issues these are mainly uh, adjuncts to actually help to, um 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 relieve the symptoms but they were not unfortunately they can't really correct such big bony uh, alignment yeah all right so maybe in your opinion um how long does it take to recover from a from a hip replacement or, or maybe a, a knee preservation surgery or a, or a hip preservation surgery How long does it, like for your tibial osteotomies? How long? I'm sorry, Bob. You're asking me. Ah, well, yeah. Well, in, well, ben, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, saying, yeah, saying the next question is it the right, next one? Yeah. Recovery. We, 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 did, we did talk about a lot of uh, procedures, I guess. You know, we talked about scopes, uh, injections. Each yes. one has a slightly different one. Um, in your, I guess maybe if I ask uh, Eugene Wei, maybe for your tibial osteotomy is where you cut the bone and put a metal plate to straighten out the leg. How long does okay. it take to recover from that? So, so the recovery usually takes up to about two to three months, quite similar to uh, atroplast, uh, uh, joint replacement surgery. Um, for our um, osteotomy, um, in the past, actually, um, the patients were subjected to non-weight bearing for a period of time to protect the uh, bone osteotomy site uh, to prevent complications like fracture. But now with the advancement of our technique where we use uh, bone graft to actually fix on your osteotomy site, we can allow earlier weight bearing. So you uh, the, now the routine uh, regime is that we partial weight bear our patient for first two weeks first. Essentially, it's for the wound to heal. Subsequently, when we remove the stitches at about two weeks mark, the patient are allowed to full weight bear. Mm -hmm. Then there may be a... Um, uh, some degree of swelling and some degree of um, uh, pain and bruising around. This takes up to about six weeks to two months to uh, uh, settle down. Yeah. Right. And how about how about you, Ben, on the, on the hip side? Uh, does it take the same amount of time? So for there, there are two main surgeries that I described earlier. So one is hip arthroscopy. Uh, for hip arthroscopy, the recovery is faster, usually about uh, two weeks uh, on crutches. And after that, uh, as uh, tolerated by pain, patients can progress to weight bearing. The full recovery sometimes takes up to one to two months. Uh, but for periastabular osteotomy, because it's a much uh, bigger surgery with a uh, cut of the bone and we require offloading for a longer period of time, usually two to three months, waiting for the bone to heal, after which the patient will need to uh, walk, uh, learn to walk again. And therefore, the whole recovery may actually take longer, maybe four to six months before the patient is. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, how long does a partial knee replacement last? Uh, so in, if done correctly, it, it probably would last almost as much uh, as long as uh, as long as uh, a total knee replacement, right? Um, are, are there any other ways to straighten bow leg? Uh, 
No, there isn't. So how to prevent bow leg? No, there's no real way. Uh, again, uh, talking about supplements, I guess supplements, I would say, perhaps maybe I'll just answer on behalf of, uh, of the speakers and for all the questions on supplements, I think there is no harm trying. You know, most of these are, are not really proven. Um, and usually we don't take supplements to prevent uh, deterioration of the joints. They are usually uh, for symptom relief. Uh, and the general guideline would be that you can try because they're generally quite safe for about three to six months. But after, subsequently, if you find that it's not working, uh, then probably uh, you shouldn't continue uh, and think of maybe investing your money somewhere else. All right, uh, let's look for uh, Mr. David Lee. He says, how fast can a patient restore their sporting activities? Yeah, so maybe about, uh, I would say, two to three months, they're able to walk, climb stairs normally. And then uh, going back to sports, usually about, I would say, three to six months, you can, you can go back to sports. All right, good. Um, all right, so how serious are knee problems in Singapore as compared with regional countries? Do we have any idea? Are we are we are we worse off than uh, other countries? Uh, uh, probably when I take this question. So we um in the Asia part of this country actually, I think um the as I think there was also another question about bow leggedness. Uh, we actually look into recently. We actually look into this. Um, uh, we have just recently published on a paper on um. Thousand over X rays that look at the alignment of the knee, and um, we found that actually in Asian country, actually there is quite high incidence of bow leggedness, uh, mainly because of the lifestyle that uh, we have. Like for example, the Japanese where you need to do a lot of high kneeling or high, um, uh, deep bending, um, um, activities like um for 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 the Muslim where they need to do prayers or um the Japanese they need to sit down. They are uh, and cross leg a lot, so all this actually predispose uh, a lot of bending, a lot of um, high pressure on the knee joints. And uh, in Asia, part of countries, we do um, observe a bit more of a, a bow leggedness, um, and the deformity usually comes more from the tibia aspect, uh, from the, the from the shin bone. Yeah, so in other countries, maybe in the Europe part, I think. If I'm not wrong, um, they may have a bit more issues with the hip joints. So, 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 yeah, it's just mainly it's, uh, cultural uh, differences uh, that, that can actually lead to all these things. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go down the list. Uh, all right. Mm. Okay, does a medial meniscus tear heal with uh, naturally with rehab on its own? Yeah. So the meniscus tear, the cushion, um, it really depends on the location of the tear, whether is it mainly in the so meniscus actually the uh there is um depending on the blood supply of the meniscus. Uh, if the tear is more at the outer aspect where the peripheral aspect, there may be a chance that they may heal. But if the meniscus is more in the central region, as where we always describe the white, white region where there's minimal blood to reach there then they tend not to heal and they may actually present with a uh, unstable flap and may cause problem. Yeah. Right. So, so the, there are many different types of meniscus tears. Uh, an MRI would be helpful in uh, det determining what kind of tear it is and that would help to determine whether it can heal on its own. So how long can a PRP injection last in your, in your experience? Where's the question? Does it... Uh, does it does it last forever? Does it last oh, okay. months? So the PRP injection, um, as I described, is mainly a platelet-rich plasma where you have the growth factors and the healing factors. Um, again, it but it depends on the degree of the degeneration or the arthritis the patient might have. Um, it's, it mean it's definitely not a cure or a, a definite um finite. Um, in, uh, infinite kind of uh, 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 effect. Uh. The, so 
you can compare with like the hyaluronic acid that uh, sometimes we uh, also give for patients can last up to maybe six months. But if it's really high degree of arthritis, sometimes we do see patients coming back like one month later and have, still having some uh, symptoms. Yeah. And uh, this tear in the meniscus, does it ultimately lead to arthritis if it's not treated? Does it increase the risk of uh, arthritis? Okay, so the, the meniscus tear, again, it depends on the location of tear and the degree of tear. Um, there are, um, as one of those slides that I showed, uh, it really depends, the, the tear depends on, it really depends on whether the tear affects the function of the meniscus, whether it uh, still serves the purpose to uh, create a wedge between the, 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 the thigh bone and the shin bone. So in particular, those tear where it results in the extrusion of the meniscus, and sometimes on the MRI scan, when we see them, we can appreciate that there is a high stress on the uh, bone changes. Those kind of tear uh, may not be uh, good to be left uh, alone. Those, those even, even on the MRI, it just shows that there is high, the joint might be uh, experiencing high stress with the lack of, due to this uh, meniscus tear, then they, they, they probably should be addressed to, to reduce the chance of uh, uh, degeneration. Yeah. Okay. Uh... I'm just scrolling through the 70 uh, pending questions. Um, if somebody is interested in participating in getting these uh, PRP injections or autobiolog autobiologics, uh, how do they how do they uh, get get that treatment? Ah, the PRP um, injection can be actually uh, provided uh, in the outpatient setting. So I think in our SGH clinic. In the OSGC, OSGC and the MSC clinic, um, it can be done. So we have nurses trained there where we can perform the um, blood drawing and then that spin down and it can be injected. Yeah. So it can be done in the outpatient setting. Right. Okay. Okay. Oh, there are many. Yes, certainly this is obviously a very relevant topic to many people, and many people have a uh, have great interest in it. And I and I sincerely hope that uh, our talks have given you some uh, better understanding uh, of of the problem. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that we are really able to answer um, all the questions, and we're coming about the time to the uh, end of our webinar. Uh, what I would uh, perhaps recommend for, you know, for, and apologies to all the questions that we were not uh, able to answer. And, and, and thank you for your, your enthusiasm and, and questions. Uh, but we will uh, subsequently provide uh, an email address uh, that you can write into and uh, we will try to answer uh, the questions um, I, I hope that uh, a, lot, a lot of these questions in part or fully have been uh, sort of discussed in prior questions. Uh, you can also scroll through some of the answered uh, questions already uh, and, and some of those answers may address your concerns. Uh, but maybe I would uh, take the opportunity as the moderator to uh, bring this webinar to a close. I'd like to thank uh, all, each and every one of you. Uh, let me see how many. Let us well, over 700 uh, participants this morning are really uh, very appreciative of uh, your spending your Saturday with us and uh, I'd like to thank uh, again all the people who put in uh, all the hard work to, to make this webinar happen and also our panel, uh, Dr. Sung Jin Wei and uh, Dr. Benjamin Ang for uh, sharing their uh, experiences, their, their knowledge and their thoughts and opinions on, on this very obviously uh, important issues that affect so many of us. Again, uh, you know, we will provide the email. Uh, you feel free to write to us and we will try to get back uh, to you as soon as possible. But once again, thank you very much for joining us on this Saturday morning. I hope you have a, a lovely uh, weekend ahead. Uh, uh, goodbye, everyone.